in verse number 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, praise your holy name. We praise you, Lord, that you do not fail us. No, we don't do right, and we don't do as we ought, even as your people, Lord, you're still ever faithful to us. If we did everything that you told us to do, in every way, and never failed, we'd still at best be unprofitable servants. But Lord, you're kind to us, and long-suffering, and patient, and, and good. We, we lift your name up, Lord. We praise your name, and we thank you for your kindness and mercy to us. I ask, Lord, that you would bless the preaching of the word. Thank you for each one that's come here tonight. We pray that you would bless them. We know that you're here among us. We know that the word doesn't go forth void. And I pray that uh, this would be a message that we need to hear. And, and though we may have a hundred different problems between us, we know that your word can address every one of them tonight. That your word is that quick and powerful, that it's living, that, that you can address whatever we need, in whatever circumstance. We thank you for Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a place to worship. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us a desire for truth and a love for truth. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to learn and to grow and to, to uh, follow and, and be confirmed in what we know. And, and uh, just uh, bless us as we uh, worship tonight. I thank you again for those here. And we pray you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll read our text one more time. James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor uh, neither shadow of turning. And tonight I want to preach on no shadow of turning. No shadow of turning. Um, an unknown author once wrote, the only thing constant is change. That uh, nothing stays the same for very long, that things change quickly. Um, a few generations know change as well as we do. Um, just in a matter of time, you go in the Bible and, and you can see change. Adam and Eve knew great change. Adam may have known greater change than anyone. Adam walked in the garden and then he died right before uh, Noah's time. So he lived a long time and he saw perfection and he saw um, the, the evil generation that brought about the flood. So Adam knew change. Noah knew change. He certainly knew change, didn't he? The, the way that the earth was before the flood and the way the word earth was after the flood. And we have an idea sometimes of Noah, a little cartoon character, and, and you know we think of the boat and the giraffe sticking the head out the window. It wasn't like that. This was one of the most devastating events that has ever happened. That great, uh, great destruction, great death upon the whole earth. I mean, could you imagine uh, in, a, in a year's time from now that just you and a few others would be the only people alive upon the earth? The, the face of the earth changed, the, the uh, animals, the, the climate, everything changed. So no, it new change. People in the Tower of Babylon knew change. You know, people were there, they spoke one language, all of a sudden everybody's speaking a different language. And they had to divide up into the languages, um, and, and they went one direction, and, and people changed after that. But for the most part, if you think about it, from that point on, it pretty much stayed the same for a long time. People fought with swords, and people rode horses, and they cooked with fires for thousands of years. But things pretty much stayed the same. You know, there was advances in, in, in different areas, but by and large, things was pretty much the same. But you think where we have come in the last 200 years, that when this country was founded, people were riding around on horses, and in the last century, people were walking on the moon. That you went from walking, writing letters and sending it by horseback, to having a computer in your pocket where you can type a message and send it all the way across the earth in a matter of seconds. In our 
And every one of us probably got a cell phone where if we try to call somebody going down the road and the call drops, we get aggravated. The, the very idea that you have a device in your pocket you can call somebody else on the other side of the world is, is astounding. Could you think of uh, Patrick Henry or George Washington or somebody like that just conceiving, being able to conceive of a cell phone? That's a lot of change. You can think about it in this terms. In 60 years time or 50 years time, we have gone from the amazement of space travel to the fact that we're just going to do away with NASA. You know, we went from walking on the moon and the amazing of that to, you know, people yawn at space travel. What, what, how quickly things change. Our government has changed. We don't have the same government we did 100 years ago. And you go from the 1770s to the 1890s, there was a big change even in that. We went from uh, sm small state governments to now a big giant federal government. Everything changes. The only thing constant is change, the author said. <coughs> but that quote isn't exactly right. It seems right to us, and it seems like uh, things change all the time, but not everything changes. The only thing constant is God. God never changes. God is the center point of all existence. He is the center. Not this earth is not the center, not our lives, they're not the center, not the sun, it's not the center, not the universe, but God. God is that center. He is that constant. He is the thing, the one that never changes. He is from which all things point and have their being. He is the thing for which you look, if you look at the world, you get all messed up, but if you look at God, you can you can set your compass to that. God is the true north of our, of our life, that, that if we look to God, we can know things are right, even though everything about us is changing. In a time of continual change in thought, in philosophy, in government, in technology, in waves of life, I derive great comfort from the fact that God never changes. I have great peace in the fact that God never changes. Things can get flipped upside down in a hurry, but God never changes that He is always faithful, He is always loving, He is always caring. God never changes, though everything else may. Whenever I was in high school, uh, I couldn't imagine anyone talking out in the open about homosexual marriage. And you know, we mention that often, but it's, it's just a sign of the judgment of God that not only people talk about it now, but they promote it and celebrate it that you have people that celebrate and talk about it and just, just lift it up as the greatest thing. You have people um, promoting immorality. You have, um, I was talking to Barry about this, I think Wednesday, but, but you can't even get on the news on the internet. You can't even look at a news channel without having um, illicit images thrown in your face. You can't turn on the television and watch the local news without having some kind of pornographic image uh, thrust upon you. That's why we don't, I don't want it in my house because it's it's right there. It's always it's right in your face. Con continually, the immorality of our land flaunting their immorality, and it just changes so quickly. And it's changing for the worse. But when we look to true north in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we see that every good gift and perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turn. Or to perhaps help us, um, another version translated this way, there is no variation or shadow due to change. There is no shadow of turning. There is great spiritual comfort and blessing to the believer in understanding and meditating on the immutability of God. We can trust God, number one, because there is no variation in God. I can trust God because there is no change in God. There is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. If God changed, it would be for the better or for the worse. If you change something, you don't change equally. You have to change for the better or for the worse. You know, if, if somebody changes their style of preaching, they're going to get it better or they're going to get worse. You don't really just say the same. If you're going to change the way you do something at work, it's either going to be better or worse. If you change your recipe, uh, add more salt or take salt away, it's going to get better or it's going to get worse. God cannot change because He is already, the, the, he is already perfection. 
If God changed, that means he would either uh, grow in knowledge or, or lose knowledge or get better or get worse. God cannot change. God can't change who he is. Um, Numbers 23:19. Um, I have some, several passages if you want to turn with me or just jot them down and study them out later. But the uh, number is 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, shall he not be, make it good? God will always be whole good. God will always be whole. God always has and always will be. And he always has and always will be perfect in everything and all his attributes. There is a heresy called open theism. And open theism is what an Armenian would be if he, he followed everything out to its logical conclusions. Um, you know, I don't, you know, most Armenians are just inconsistent. That they don't understand their inconsistency in their doctrine. That many of them uh, just don't think about things all the way through. And don't think about the, the logical ramifications of their doctrine. But if you follow Arminianism all the way out to its logical conclusions, um, I believe you'd end up in open theism, which means that God can change. That God does not know what's going to happen. That God set the world in motion, and then God gives man a free will, and, and man has the ultimate libertarian free will, and God is just kind of watching to see what's going to take place. That's not the God of the Scripture. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. God is not a, a man that he should change. That God is the sovereign, omnipotent ruler of all things. He is the one who ordains the uh, end from the very beginning. God does not change, and neither casts a shadow of change. God is, is all, there is no variation in our Lord. God cannot change who He is. God cannot change His will. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 29. God cannot change in His person. God cannot change in His will. 1 Samuel 15, 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. God does not change his will. Now, some, someone may say, no, wait a second. It says in the book of Jonah that God changed his mind, and it says in other places that God changed. Well, God's repentance is what they call an anthropomorphism. It is a figure of speech that gives God human feelings and emotions to describe what he does so that we can understand it. God did not change. The Ninevites changed. Remember, God prepared Jonah. He prepared the fish. He prepared, prepared the message. And he told Jonah, you go preach to these Ninevites. And you tell them that destruction is coming. God prepared Jonah to go preach. He prepared the message. And it was his will to do that. It was God's will to show mercy. It was God's will that he preached this judgment, but because of the judgment preached, he showed mercy to the deserving sinner. Now, God had his man go to this particular place, to this particular people, and preach this particular message. And what it shows in terms that we can understand that the wrath of God abided upon them and unless they repented of their sins, God would judge them. But it was this, this uh, message of God's judgment that showed them their need for a Savior and mercy. This was God's ordained, sovereign plan all along. That God did not send Jonah to the Amalekites. He didn't send Jonah to the Philistines. He didn't send Jonah to the Ethiopians. He didn't send Jonah to, to, to any other nation or any other people. He sent them to the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want to go to the Ninevites. He wanted to go somewhere else. He wanted to go to his own country and preach this message. But God said, no, my people in this city at my time and my message, you go preach this message here. See, this was God's plan all along. So God did not change. The Ninevites changed. And God showed mercy. It was ordained in God's providence. In the conditional promise of judgment to Nineveh, or the, uh, that, that they would repent and, and turn to him. God used this uh, warning of judgment 
that they might repent of, of their sin. So when it speaks of God's repentance in that manner, it's speaking of the, the conditional uh, warning that comes to all people that, that sin is upon them. When I heard of the judgment of sin, and when I feared the fires of hell, that was real, and I knew that if I died, I was going to slip right into the fire. And without Christ, I would have. But I also know that I was God's uh, precious sheep, and I was not a goat, I was a lost sheep. And that those fears of impending doom and judgment brought me to my knees in repentance and faith in Christ. God did not change. I, he changed me. Or you think of the setting up of Saul as king of Israel. That didn't take God by surprise. That didn't take God by surprise at all. But this was God setting up uh, Saul as a king to give the people what they wanted, to show the people what they wanted was not what was best for them. And, and all along, it was never going to be of the tribe of Benjamin. Because uh, Jacob, uh, uh, as Jacob blessed his children as he was dying. It wasn't Benjamin that said that the scepter shouldn't fall from him. Who was it? It was Judah. It was never going to be the tribe of Benjamin that continued on. So even as God set him up, he didn't forget about his promise to Judah. He didn't forget about the prophecy, the prophecies of the line of the tribe of Judah. But he set Saul up and he brought Saul down. It didn't surprise God and God didn't change his mind. But for our ability to understand and to say things in ways that our minds can wrap around the sovereignty of the Most High God, we have these appearances of change and these figures of speech used. God has promised damnation for all that do not believe in Christ. Before one is saved, the wrath of God abides upon them. But God didn't change. He changes his people. If God changed, it would be because he lacked information. But I know that our, the God's people's names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and the foundation of the world. I read in my Bible that God um, chose his people before he created the heavens and the earth. I read in my Bible that God has the names of his people in the Lamb's Book of Life and they will never be erased out of it. So if God does not change. He doesn't need new information and he doesn't write and erase and add to um, his uh, sovereign will. Um, why would he change? If God could change, why would he? Was it because of lack of information? Because something new happened and God didn't foresee? Well, that's blasphemy. Of course not. God doesn't need to change. He doesn't change his mind. A million years from now, God will not change his mind about redemption. A billion years from now, God will not change his mind about sin. That's why I don't understand about some people that, that say, well, that was Old, that was old Testament. We don't, we're not under the law. You know that, that God hated murder in the Garden of Eden. God hated lying in the Garden of Eden. God despised um, adultery and idolatry in the Garden of Eden before they had those tablets of stone. God hated that. You read in the book of Leviticus that the people were cast out of the land because of 450 years of wickedness and idolatry and depravity. Before, 400 years before the, the tablets came down from the mountain with Moses, that they were committing these sins that, that got them cast out, the, the Canaanites that is. God doesn't change his mind about sin. Uh, sin is always hatred, hated in God's eye. He's not going to change his mind about it. He's not going to get down the road and say, you know what, I was wrong about um, uh, marriage. There should, you, know, you should be able to marry as people, many people as you want. Of course not. From the beginning it was not so, and anything beyond that it won't be so. And it doesn't matter if the United States says that polygamy is okay, which they probably will, the rate where we're going. God said from the beginning it was not so, and it, and it, and it won't be in God's mind. God's not going to change his mind. Society changes. God doesn't change, and His Word doesn't change. God will not change His mind about the lake of fire. God will not change His mind about His eternal purpose in salvation and redemption. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, and the thoughts of His heart to all generations, it says in Psalm 33, 11. God's plan is eternal and will always stand. God's thoughts are for all people and all generations. God's will, His providence, His rules that shape the events of our life, it's not shaped by uh, uh, 
just a, a, a random happenings. You know, we have to adapt to our situation. You know, nobody grows up and thinks, well, this, is, this travesty is going to happen to me in a few years, and this is how I'm going to deal with it. No, we grow up and we think, you know, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to get married and this is what's going to happen. And, and you know, the longer that you live, you see that the plans for tomorrow just, you know, sometimes you just feel like, what's the sense in even making plans? Because things change so quickly. You, know, you start the day, best day that you've ever had, and by the end of the day, you might be in tears. So that things change. Things change so quickly. And, and, and we just feel like, Sometimes you can be out in the midst of the ocean, just, just rudderless and without wind, without sail, just being blown about. And we just do the best that you can to hang on. But God rules all situations and they work according to His counsel. That everything that happens is according to God's will, whether we understand it or not. God doesn't change because of fickleness. We, we can be fickle about things. We like something one minute and hate it the next. And we, can, we can love somebody one minute and be their worst enemy the next. People are fickle. You know, false, false gods are fickle. If you've ever studied the, the Greek gods in school or read about them or anything, you know, they're fickle. The, uh, the God of Islam, he's a fickle God. He can, be, he can love you one second and be angry with you another. There's a story in, uh, of it's not in the Quran, I don't think, but it's, it's, maybe it is, I'm not sure. But the, the, the one guy um, had committed atrocities, and he took one step, uh, he was one step closer to the middle uh, of Mecca, and when he died, he got to go to heaven because he had taken that one extra step. That, that if he hadn't taken that last step, he would have been 49% you know, of the way instead of 51% of the way. Uh, or something along those lines. But the point is, it's fickleness. That, you know, they're with you today, uh, maybe gone tomorrow. That, that God is not throwing tantrums. God doesn't lose his mind in a fit of uncontrollable rage. God is not fickle like that. That, that we don't have to, to fear God in the sense that, that if we, we do the wrong thing, that, he just, he, that the lightning is going to come down and destroy us immediately. He, he is not fickle like the false gods. In Exodus 34, 6, it says this, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Or in Numbers 14, 18, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. God is long-suffering. And if you don't believe that, turn on uh, one of these uh, false uh, religious television shows. Turn on TBN and, and look at some of those guys that have been on there for uh, 20, 30 years preaching prosperity heresy, preaching uh, blasphemies, doing the works of the devil in the names of God, milking people out of who knows how many millions of dollars, stealing them in the name of Christ, and yet they continue to live. They continue to live, getting on television, and standing in the name of Christ and blaspheming His name, making men and women um, the, the child of hell, and, and stealing their money in the name of Christ. And yet they live. And yet God allows them their breath. We want to talk about long sufferings. You want to talk about the long suffering of God holding uh, forth His great uh, judgment and His great... Um, wrath towards these wicked sinners. Well, God is long-suffering. He's long-suffering to the wicked and long-suffering to um, His people. God has called His people to act like Him. He has not called us to act in a fickle manner, but He has called us to act um, in a long-suffering way. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, uh, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Galatians 5.22, or Ephesians 4.2, I read this morning, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. God calls us to act like Him, not to be, uh, to, to be long-suffering. And, and in 
and to act like he does. So, so God doesn't change just in an instant like we do, but he is long-suffering and patient. But God is not being consistent. That's another thing that we need to remember. Um, one, people, one reason people hate God is because of his holiness. They don't like God's holiness. His purity and his perfection show his complete consistency. His justice condemns perfectly. And his law is not fickle. That, that things are black and white. Things are black and white, right or wrong, good or evil, with God. And God is not, God is a just judge. We don't like unjust judges in our world. We like justice. You know, we like things that are right and wrong. And you know, like the proverb says, paraphrase it, whoever tells the story first is right, but the neighbor comes along and tells the other side. And, and you know, that's the kind of way I feel with like the, the shooting that happened there in, in uh, Missouri, that whoever tells the story first, whoever gets it out there first, when you know, everybody agrees with him, told you, just wait and be patient and hear the other side of the story and say, well, wait a second, half the facts are gone. So I don't like comment on things such as that, but you know what I want out of that situation? You know what everybody wants, I think, is justice. We want... We want whatever, whoever did wrong, we want them to be punished. And we don't want the innocent to be punished. We want the guilty to be punished. We want justice. And God does not change in his justice. God is completely holy and he's completely just. And whenever a sinner looks up to God in his word and says, uh-oh, I've committed all these sins. Not just one of them, but all of them. You either bow and beg for mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you slam the book and say, I don't want to hear any more of it. I don't like this God and His holiness and His justice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebel. I'm going to rebel against Him, and I don't want to hear anything about it anymore. So people hate God because He is just and holy. We can trust God because He's unchanging. He is our rock and our shelter in any storm because there's no change in it. And not only can we trust Him, but we can praise God. So that's the second thing. We see the power and the greatness of God because there is no shadow of turning. We can praise Him because we see the power and the greatness of God because there is no shadow of turning. God does not move or change. Our shadow falls depending on our relationship to the light, doesn't it? If you go out and stand in the parking lot in, in, in the morning and let the sun hit you, it's going to go a different direction. Or if you wait and then in the east the sunlight changes, you know it's going to cast it in a different direction. If you go out and you start walking around and start moving around, your shadow changes. When you change, your shadow changes. We turn and we cast a shadow and it changes. But consider this text where there is no shadow of change with God. There is no shadow that is cast by the change of God. In the Garden of Eden, that didn't take God by surprise either. He didn't go back to the drawing board because he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Even when his creation rebels against him, he ordained this for his ultimate good. God is not the author of sin nor the cause of sin, but nonetheless it is in accordance to his providence. As someone uh, said, uh, God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. And the crooked stick, stick of Satan's rebellion and the crooked stick of God, man's rebellion, God will overrule and, and draw the straight line uh, for his ultimate good and his ultimate glory. What was meant for evil, God means for good. And he overrules the wicked plans for his glory to accomplish his plan. But in all this, God is constant and God never changes. There is no shadow of change cast by God, the Father of lights, movements from one direction to the other. Since God is the Father of lights, there is no shadow cast upon God. There's light in every direction with God. So not only is there no shadow because God is changing His direction to the light, that God is the light and casts no shadow. You see the, the picture that James is drawing here. That he's, he's showing us that He is the Father of lights. And every good gift comes from God, the Father of lights. And there is no shadow that is cast from God. Because God it doesn't get a light from somewhere else. God is not in time and subject to, to, to time. or subject to anything else. He is the ultimate light. He is the light. And there is no shadow of change cast by God because He moves in relationship to the light or there is any shadow in God. 
But he is the true light. He never changes and never casts the shadow. There's no shadow in God's omniscience and omnipresence to prevent or cause a, a shadow of turning. God knows all things. How can he change? I've had to change my mind multiple times because I've received more information. New information will not come before God's eyes. I had to ship something to China, and, and it was a pump, and the guy said, we want this pump to put on a boat. We want it to leave Savannah on this day and ship it to China. And we did, I did exactly everything the guy asked me. And it was getting ready to ship out. And then the guy says, oh, wait a second. When's it going to be here? I need it in two weeks. Well, it takes a month for the boat to get to China. And it takes a week for it to get off. So we're, you know, it's not going to get there in a month. It's going to get there in a month and a half, not in two weeks. Well, I had new information now. He added something to me. So I had to change my plans and their plans. We had to change how much he charged them because we had to change everything around. New information came to me. And my plan, which I thought had worked out good for everybody, turns out it was going to be a disaster. I got new information that changed the plan of everybody. I had to change the plan of the people we ordered with, the people on the boat. They had to get it off the boat. And all kinds of different things had to happen. But no information, new information, comes before God's eyes. The angel doesn't come before God with a fact sheet and say, you know, this is the new information that we have for you today. God knows all things, always and forever. And He does not and cannot change. God knows what you'll have for breakfast in the morning. God knows if you'll have a morning tomorrow. God knows the day of our death. God knows, uh, God knows how many hairs you have on your head. God knows how many breaths you have left in your life. He knows everything. And God is om omnipresent, being in all places at all times. He cannot change. Nothing escapes God's eye, view, or attention. Every strand of DNA as within our, the fiber of our being has God's utmost attention as if that one tiny little strand or that one tiny little cell in your body was the only thing in the universe. All of God's creation is ever before Him. And all things are made by Him and for Him and through Him are all things made. So we, we serve an omnipresent God that is here among us and here everywhere. We serve a God who does not change in His omnipotence. If He has all power, what can He change? Did He gain more power? Did He get less power? No, if it were possible for God to change, He wouldn't be God at all. Not only does God not change, but there isn't even a shadow cast by His change. This outside source of light provides the shadow. So if you see the light up here, it's casting the shadow under my hand. There's a shadow under my hand. But there's no light directly under that light. That is God. He's putting out light. And He's not putting out a shadow. He is the only source of light. God is the Father of lights. In all directions, there is light. In all directions, there's love and purity and goodness and holiness and consistency. In every direction of God, no matter where you look at God, either from the Old Testament or from the New Testament, from His love or His judgment, from any of His attributes, at any angle, there is nothing but light. There is nothing but goodness. There is nothing but holiness. And this tells us that not only God does not change, but there is no hint of change in God. God is the absolute picture of perfection in all of His glory, in all of His attributes, in all of His words. There is nothing that could be better about God. There is nothing that could be more glorious about God. That everything that God does and says and is and ever will be is the absolute picture of perfection. And God can't get any better. That's a, what a greatness we have. What a great God that we have. God's greatness is seen in the fact that there is no shadow of turning with Him. He is trustworthy and He is dependable. He is to be praised for His immutability. There is also the personal relevance to this great truth on how it affects us as God's people. And lastly, we'll look at that that we can be comforted as believers in God. Because the good and perfect gifts of the unchangeable God. We can be comforted as believers in God because of the good and perfect gifts of the unchangeable God. The text here tells us that every good gift is from God. That means temporal gifts. Adam Clark says, From God, who is infinite, the infinite fountain, Father and source of all good, 
All good comes. And whatever can be called good, pure, or light, or its excellence of any kind, must necessarily spring from him. And he is the only source of all goodness and perfection. You have health. You have a measure of health. That is a good gift from God. You have a home. That is a good gift from God. You have clothing. You have any friends. You have any family. Thank God for his unchangeably good temporal gifts in your life. All good things come from God. Amen. You know the love that a father has for a son or a mother for a daughter? You know that love is, comes from the love of God? And if you don't know God, you don't really know how to love. You know, people, people think that they know how to love. People think that they love. And, and to some respect, expense, in some instance they do, but not really. They don't really understand that you can't know true love unless you know God. That you can't rightly love your spouse unless you rightly love God. And that you can't rightly love your children unless you have a right relationship with God. That, that you can love in some natural sense, but to really appreciate and really know love, you can't know anything about God. All, good, all gifts are from God. Sometimes, something we feel bad has happened. God always does right, and he's always, He always does right. No matter what we think of it, we can know, well, Lord, I don't know why you did that, but I know that you do right. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Why were the rebellious Jews in the Old Testament not utterly destroyed? You know, on Wednesday nights, we're going through uh, the Bible and uh, Briefly looking at each book, now we're in uh, Joshua. We just got done with Joshua, we're going into the Judges, and you know, as we quickly move through these books, you know, you just say, why did God let them live? Why didn't God just wipe them off utterly and destroy them? They were always breaking His laws. They were always leaving the path that He set before them. They were always forsaking the way. Why was Jacob not destroyed? Why did God not destroy them? God made a promise to Abraham, and he made a promise to Isaac, and he made a promise to Jacob. And God's going to keep his promise. That's what he told him there, Malachi. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know why you're not consumed? Because I am God, and I don't change, and I don't go back on my word, is what he told him. You know, the, the people in Malachi, the Malachi was talking to them, saying, yeah, we can get away with anything, because God's not going to change. That, that we can sin, we can rebel, we can live how we want to because God hasn't destroyed us before. And Malachi tells them what God tells them. No, I'm God. I'm Jehovah and I don't change. And that's the reason why I haven't consumed you because I made a promise to Jacob and I haven't fulfilled my promise. So though Israel was fickle and though Israel changed with the wind, it seemed like, and even when they broke God's laws, God's corrective chastisement did not utterly destroy that chosen nation because God doesn't change. That's the same reason why we are not concerned when we sin against God. And when we uh, bring dishonor to the Lord's name, that's why God doesn't consume us and say, you know what, I'm, I'm done, I'm going to forget about it. God does not change. God made an eternal covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood was shed for us. God's not going to change. He's not going to say that's too much. You know, he said it's finished. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God will not take away the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's without repentance. God will not take away the gift of hope, uh, eternal life. It is without repentance. Or the gift of adoption, or pardon, and peace, and justification, and the future glorification. God doesn't give spiritual gifts and take them back and take them away. Hebrews 6.18 says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay up hold upon the hope set before us. God will not allow his people who trust in him to fall away forever. By two immutable things, two things that can't change, God can't change, his word can't change, and God can't lie. God can't tell a lie, and God can't change. So if God tells us that we trust in Him, and He can't change and He can't tell a lie, we have a strong refuge to, to anchor our soul to. 
We have a refuge that keeps the soul. We have that refuge to hold on to and to cling on to because God doesn't change and God doesn't lie. And I can go to sleep tonight and I can lay my head down on my pillow and know that I'm forgiven and I'm justified and God doesn't change and God doesn't lie. It doesn't matter what else is happening. God doesn't change and God doesn't lie. God's word doesn't change. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God's law won't change. You can trust your life. You can use this book as a guide. It's unchangeable, it's unshakable, and it's unmovable. Science changes. Theories and understanding of the universe changes. In the 1970s, we were going into global cooling, and another ice age was going to start. Then, it turns into global warming, and the earth is going to melt, because it's going to get so hot. They can't make up their mind. What's going to happen? And their theories change. It changes all the time. That's why, that's why, uh, uh, well, that's why General Stonewall Jackson died. He got shot in the Civil War, and his own doctors is what killed him because they were using the prevailing medicine at the time. Um, he died of pneumonia. He started getting pneumonia, and they said, well, the best thing you can do is lay in bed and don't move. And they threw everybody else out of the room because the general was there, and they made those other soldiers go out and walk around in the cold. Well, they started walking around and started breathing, and they got over it. But the general they were trying to save laid there, and the pneumonia got worse and they killed him. You know, Science changes, and, and people look back at that and say, wow, you know, they didn't know anything about science. We don't know anything about science. You know, one day coffee is good for you, the next day it's going to kill you, and a month later it's good for you again. Eggs are good for you one year, they're bad for you the next year. It changes. Our understanding changes. But God's word is settled forever. F political philosophies change. World has changed. You have the ancient world, the medieval world, you have the Renaissance time, you have modern thought. We're now into postmodern thought, postmodern worldview and philosophies. It always is changing, but God's word never changes. God's word didn't change for David or Jeremiah or for the Apostle Paul, and it doesn't change for us. God is the center, He is the true north to set our the compass of our lives to. And whether we walk in the desert or we drive cars, God is always true north. For our lives. And, and whether they live in Palestine or they live in Georgia, God's word never changes. Though society changes, God's word is sure. And it doesn't matter if you ride on a, on a horse or fly in a spaceship, God's word doesn't change. It's the same for those who ride on computers as those who wrote things etched in stone. For those in China as well as those in the United States. For those who are in the big house and for those who are in the poor house. From the Wall Street bankers to the farmers, from the kings and the paupers, from the old and for the young, God's word is settled and God does not change. Since God doesn't change, his word doesn't change and it never will. And his laws never change and they never will. And no matter what station we are in our life, this word is true. It is the plumb line by which we will be judged and which we are measured. It is the, the final standard of black and white by which we can follow our lives and lead our lives and raise our children and, and guide our marriage. It is the, the final rule and authority by which all things are settled and all controversies are, are settled out. And I can read this book and take God's word and be comforted in that because God does not change. God is compared to a rock in Scripture. And I take comfort in that. He's unmovable and strong. Men will turn on him. Men are fickle and inconsistent and given to change. But within the world there is an arm of flesh, but with God he is the Lord to help and fight our battles. We don't trust in man. We don't trust in princes and horses, as the psalmist says, but we trust in God. We can't trust in the government to help people. We can't trust in ourselves to help ourselves. We can only trust in God. We can not always trust, um, we can always trust on the things people say or anything like that. We can only trust in God. God is unshakable and unchanging. There is no situation that will, that will arise that has not been lovingly ordained by the hand of our loving Father. Be comforted. God does not change. God will change His Word. He doesn't change His mind. There will be not, there'll not be some new way of salvation now the road. If God has made you free, you are free indeed. Enjoy the liberty with which the Lord has given you. 
The continual doubting of God's promises tell you that you think God is fickle and he's going to change his mind. God won't change his word. He won't change his mind. Trust in the God who doesn't change. Trust in the God who has no shadow of turning. May the Lord bless you through the week. And may God bless the preaching of his word. And let's stand and be dismissed. And, uh, go to Mark if you would close in prayer for us, please. Now, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful today for your unchanging mobile. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we pray for each and every one here tonight. And thank you for the many blessings you've given us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, each and every one on our prayer list. Uh, we pray that your will be done in our lives and in theirs too. Heavenly Father, uh, you're with us now as we go our separate ways. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Uh, Heavenly Father, most of all, forgive us of our many sins. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.